All right, if you've got your Bibles with you this morning, go ahead and turn to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 6, we'll begin reading at verse 27. figured out yet or not, just how important I think it is what we do here on each and every Sunday morning. Are you beginning to get some idea of how important I think it is? Can I just say to you this morning that we hope for America is gathering in rooms much like this one across America this morning. That includes you, each and every one of you, and I wish I could get you to begin to understand your importance and your value and how important your witness is. Not just that we schedule a church meeting or that we even have a place to gather or that we come and to gather, but the importance of the part that you play and the role that you have and the assignment that you've been given within that same context. The hope for America is gathering in rooms much like this one this morning all across America. Amen. The hope isn't with the people who are in such sad, sad shape this morning because of last night's activities that they don't know who they are or where they are. Hmm. Or who just for whatever reason have rejected the Lord. The hope is in rooms like this this morning. And not only for America, but for Christianity. Christianity is going through a period of being redefined. Heresy has so infiltrated our theology. Uh, we have become such grace abusers and have such a poor, shallow understanding of what grace and mercy really is that we've interpreted those principles to be little more than a free pass to the amusement park of life which means hey I can not only do what everybody else does I can do it and not even have to feel bad about it later mm. the hope for America and Christianity is gathered in rooms like this this morning and I want you to understand how important that is and I want you to understand how important it is that you made the sacrifice to gather here this morning Let's begin looking at a particular point in history for the nation of Israel, and we'll talk about it this morning and, and kind of bring it full circle. Beginning at verse 27, we find these words. God is speaking to Jeremiah, the prophet, and he says, Jeremiah, I have made you a tester of metals, that you may determine the quality of my people. They are the worst kind of rebel, full of slander. They are hard as bronze and iron, and they lead others into corruption. The bellows fiercely fan the flames to burn out the corruption, but it does not purify them. For the wickedness remains. I will label them rejected silver, for I, the Lord, am discarding them. Would you join me in prayer? Father God, we give you all the glory and credit for all that we are, all that we'll ever be, for the fact that we're here this morning or the, de or the desire that we even have to be here. And God, we lay it all at your feet. God, we just confess that you are the God of the universe. God, make us, uh, may, may we allow you to be the God of our lives. We just ask that you would speak clearly to us this morning that what is said not that we would take it personal in the sense that we might be offended, but that we would take it personal as if it was being spoken into the very core of our being, the very most uh, intricate fiber of our spiritual self, and that we would understand how important it is, each action, each thought, each deed, each decision, that, that there are no free passes, that there are no unimportant moments but that every step of our way, every piece of our life has been orchestrated by you, uh, finally defined and laid plan uh, that is intended to give you glory uh, and be empowered divinely to fulfill that plan 
And God, I just ask that you would show us this morning the importance, not only of your plan, but the part that we play in that, through the preaching of your word, and for your glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Things have meaning and value only in their given context. Did you catch that? Things have meaning and value only in their given context. Did you catch it? Things have value and meaning only in their given context. All right, let me give you an example. Try walking up to a, on the sidewalk, try walking up to a complete stranger and pledging them your unfailing love and undying devotion with all the heartfelt feelings that you could possibly muster. What do you think that that would mean to them? Does it have any meaning? Maybe it means that it's time to get another psychiatric evaluation. <laughs> and that might be the extent of it. Are you with me? Things have meaning and value only in their given context. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 says that there is a right time and a right place for everything. Things have meaning and value only in their given context. And as defined or determined by the law of supply and demand. How many has heard that term before? Okay. Salt has been much credited for the development of civilization as we know it today. How many knew that? Salt, of all things, salt, highly prized for its Many life-sustaining properties. Empires, literally, if you do a Google search, you'll see it really quickly. Google search everything else and verify the preacher's facts. Fact check. Uh, if you look, you will see the empires literally have been built and lost in attempts to control the production and trade of salt. In ancient Greece, slaves were sometimes traded for salt. A slave who failed to meet its new owner's expectations was said to not be worth his, say it with me, salt. How many's heard that saying before? That's where it came from. Today, salt is plentiful and inexpensive. Uh, before COVID, it was on the restaurant table at any and every restaurant you go to. Go through the drive-thru. You get little paper packets, right? Everywhere. Inexpensive. They would give it to you. Well, you're paying for it somewhere, but it, it's kind of a gratuitous thing, almost like napkins, right? Yeah, it's inexpensive. Plentiful. There was a time when silk was considered one of the most precious commodities in the world. Trade routes, both by land and sea, connected literally the east to the west primarily to bring silk from China to be traded for wool, silver, and gold. They say that fashion follows form. How many has heard that? If that is so, then it's not hard to understand why silk has fallen out of favor with clothing designers as modern societies make the shift towards active wear uh, and uh, more casual clothing. Spices specifically cinnamon, ginger, and pepper, among others, once drove an extremely profitable world market. Other things like precious metals, iron, silver, and gold seem to have had longer lasting or better lasting power. And eventually, most things seem to fall out of favor. Now, our text this morning contains some of the very last words of warning given to Jerusalem before their conquest at the hands of King Nebuchadnezzar. How many's heard that name before? And the Babylonian Empire. Because of their unconfessed sin and the hardness of their hearts, God had rejected his chosen people. I want you to hold that thought in mind. I think there's a message today for you and I. Because not only are there great parallels 
in our history and shared history somewhat with the nation of Israel. Uh, but I think that there are also uh, a warning here that's rele relevant for us as well. God rejected his chosen people once upon a time. And he did, speaking through the prophet Jeremiah, he said, God said that they were the worst kind of rebels, and he branded them rejected silver. Think about that. Rejected silver, something which had once held great value, but was now worthless. This morning I want to speak to you about rejected silver. More specifically, about how not to become discarded silver. Number one, if you're taking notes this morning, take inventory of your life regularly. Take inventory of your life regularly. Take inventory of your life regularly. What and done doesn't get it done. Except maybe in UK basketball. Even that has proven debatable. John Calipari. I can't watch basketball anymore. Yeah, I don't understand at what point a, a university hired a coach to make social statements and so forth and so on. You can agree, you don't have to agree. Get up off your knees and coach a ball game. What kind of student athletes are you producing? What kind of character are you instilling? A great coach, I get it, all that. I'm not kneeling on the floor with anybody when the national anthem is played. Just saying. The truth of the matter is, though, that no one likes to have their life placed under a microscope. Much less to open oneself up for self-examination. And yet that is exactly what God instructs us to do. Examine yourselves, he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5. Examine yourselves. Well, wait a minute, I don't want to do that. That sounds painful, Julie. I, don't, I, I have a natural aversion to that. Yes, and so do you. But God says examine yourself. Well, what's the alternative? We need to understand. If we don't examine ourselves, he will examine us for <laughs> us. We will be examined one way or the other. God's saying, the choice, my plan, what I have, my best intention for you is to examine yourself. Examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Well, what does that say to you? I don't know. What does it say to you? Here's what it says to me. It says that I may believe I'm in the faith and there may be a chance when in fact Paul said I'm not in the faith. And then I better know if I'm in the faith or not. And the only way that I'm going to make that determination is if I examine myself. Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Prove David cheat. Prove Sheila Lair. Prove Edda Smith. No! It says you better prove yourself, whether you're in the faith. Know ye not that your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. Taking a long, hard look in the mirror isn't always the most pleasant thing we can do. How many knows that? Chuck Ross, have you ever, have you ever, have you ever done a bathroom and not put a mirror over the vanity? Has it ever happened? Probably never will. And mirrors elsewhere in the home. How many's got a mirror over their vanity? How many's got a mirror somewhere else? How often do you look in the mirror? Be honest. Unless you're, unless you're Chuck. Every time you look like. <laughs> mirror, mirror on the wall. Who is the fairest feller of all? <laughs> Don't miss it. I've been in Chuck's house. He's got a mirror on every wall. Now we know why. Oh my goodness. Uh, I'm, about, I'm wanting to get sidetracked. I can't. How many times do you look in the mirror? There's one over every vanity, no matter how many bathrooms you got, probably in every home in America. Restrooms, restaurants, it doesn't matter. But how many times do you really look in it? Because why? Well, it's not really the most pleasant thing to do. 
It's something you do more out of necessity than anything else. Am I, <laughs> do I need to comb my ears? Do I need, you know, have my eyebrows grown together? Is, that, is there something on my face? You know, do, do I need to be more presentable? You know, those are reasons that we probably should look in the mirror. Outside of that, we probably don't spend a lot of time looking in the mirror. Am I right? Why? Because it's not always the most pleasant experience that there is. Often, we'll see something we don't like. How many times you ever look in the mirror and see something you don't like? Probably almost every time you look in the mirror. It's like, well, Pastor, you put on a little weight again, and we can see it in your jaw. <laughs> yeah, quit looking in the mirror. Take off some weight. That's your job. That's your options. Those are your choices. But looking in a mirror isn't always the most pleasant thing that we can do. Usually when you look in the mirror, you see something that you don't like. Sometimes a person in the mirror staring back at us barely recognizes it. Am I the person of faith that I say I am? Am I the person of faith that my wife and children and grandchildren think that I am? Am I the person of faith that I could be? Am I the person of faith, Jeff, that I should be already? And is there any proof? Either way, is my faith a mere figment of someone's imagination? Is it more wishful thinking than anything else? Are there more I hope so's than I know so's? Is the only person I'm really fooling? Myself. It matters. God had tested the people of Judah and he could find no purity in their lives. They continued in their sin because they refused to be examined. Discarded silver, God called them. Regular seasons of self-examination in partnership with the Holy Spirit or the power of the Holy Spirit will prevent you and me from becoming discarded silver. And can I say there's nothing more important today? There's nothing more important to the world. There's nothing more important to Christianity in general. There's nothing more important to your family. There's nothing more important to you then that you not become discarded silver. The eternal reward of self-examination will far outweigh the present discomfort, I promise. And I will also tell you that it gets easier the more we do it. And the more that we learn that it is God, our only hope of change, who is our ever-present agent of change. Being confident of this very thing, Philippians 1, 6 says, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Number one, take inventory of your life regularly. Who's with me? Still with me? Number two, be honest about what you find. Be honest about what you find. Don't just simply ignore what you find. Don't justify what you learn with secular statements like times and people change or I'm not as bad as you fill in the blank with someone else's name. Because you see, the truth is and scriptures say that God never changes. His standards and expectations for how we are to live in a godless world never change. Malachi chapter 3 verse 5 and 6 says, And I will come near to you to judgment, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers and adulterers and against false swearers, liars, and against those that oppress the hireling and his wages, the widow and the fatherless, and that turn aside the stranger from his right and fear not me. Well, that got that, that just got us all, didn't it? Swift judgment against those who fear me not, 
saith the Lord of hosts, for I am the Lord. I change not. Hebrews 13, 8 says, Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. Don't make excuses for why you choose to continue in that which God has forbid. Would have he had it or she had it, then I wouldn't have. See, the truth of the matter is, H.B., we're not going to stand before God with our co-conspirators. If we were, that would be somewhat comforting. Because I'm kind of a short feller. And most everybody I'm into my whatever with is taller and bigger than me. I might, I might slip through the cracks. I might hide behind their shoulder. I might let them take a step forward. That's what we think, is it not? But the truth of the matter is we'll not stand before God with our co-conspirators or our partners in crime to answer for what we've done. We'll not pass the blame. For we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive his due for the things done in the body, whether good or bad. Honesty with ourselves Honesty among ourselves and honesty with God will prevent us from becoming discarded silver. You hear what I'm saying this morning, church? Number one, take inventory of your life regularly. Number two, be honest about what you find. Number three, confess your sin. Here's what I want you to hear. This is the good stuff. Anybody didn't hear anything. It, 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 it's like it's like the it's like the uh, minor league player that gets to the majors. He's up there looking for something he's never seen before. It's like when you see something that he's never seen before in his first few at bats at that level. Am I right, Chuck? Hold it, ball game. One and two, probably nothing you haven't seen before. Number three. Here's where I want. Here's where I want to help you this morning. Confess your sins. Confessing our sins is more about coming into agreement with God's perspective than it is assigning blame. Boy, there's a new one. Did you hear what I said? Confessing our sins is much more about coming in alignment with God's perspective then it is assigning blame. I just wish that Christians could grasp this precious truth. There is therefore no more condemnation. We associate confession with condemnation. That's wrong. It has nothing to do with it whatsoever. I believe in my heart of hearts that we shy away from confessing our sin because we're afraid of the condemnation that we're going to face. Folks, that's not scriptural. At least not what God's shown me it's not. At all. From our perspective, placing blame means that we've identified who's at fault. For if we can identify whom to blame, then we can punish accordingly. Are you with me? Is that how we think? Are we in agreement? That's how we think. Okay? Confessing our sins to God has nothing to do with punishment and everything to do with forgiveness. Now, I won't lie. Genuine confession is accompanied by pain and remorse. It must be. Or it's not genuine confession. But again, it has nothing to do with being punished. and has everything to do with simply gaining God's perspective. Sorrow expressed through confession is a genuine soul response to realizing how far we have missed God's plan for our lives and not just the result of being punished for every and each sin. Did you hear what I said? Once I was blind, the songwriter says, but now I see. If we could begin to understand how sweet is God's forgiveness, I believe we would welcome confession 
as the instrument of restoration that it is, not a cruel rod of harsh punishment, but it is a warm, welcoming embrace of an all-loving Father. Confessing our sins, coming in agreement with God's perspective, will prevent us from becoming discarded in sin. Boy, that's good stuff, preacher. Amen. I sure like, I'm sure glad you shared that with me this morning. Amen. How many's had a fear of confessing before? How many feels like that you're coming before God, and if you admit it, it is what it is, I did it, that God's just going to drop the roof, the roof on you? Is it not what we think? That has nothing to do with confession. That's man's system. That's not God's way. God is saying, come here, my child. Come in agreement with me. Quit denying that what you did isn't what I wanted for your life. It wasn't part of your plan. Come and say, hey, yeah, I'm in agreement. God said, don't do, I did, it's done, whatever. And God said, hey, come here. It's all good. It's all good. Let it finish. It's all good. And then what's it say? responsible, all-loving Father. Why? Because He has our best interest at heart. Not just today, but forever. Confessing our sins and coming into agreement with God's perspective will prevent us from becoming discarded in sin. Take inventory of your life regularly. Be honest about what you find. Confess your sin, number four. Change your course. Change your course. Genuine confession must be followed by genuine repentance. Again, I believe that we are grossly confused. What does it really mean to repent? How many knows anything about the Catholic faith? Pray for the dead. What's the Bible say? Don't pray for the dead. Don't cut yourself. Don't mark yourself. Don't pray for the dead. Why would a faith say pray for the dead? Because they grossly misunderstand what it means to repent. If you come before a loving father and confess your sins, it's already taken care of. And either you've repented or you haven't. Purgatory. How many's heard of that? Hey, they got to go there. That's the holding tank to see which way they're going to go. Really? That's not scriptural. That is the product of a gross misinterpretation or understanding of the scriptures. What does it really mean to repent? We, can, we equate repentance with doing time. Right? Well, I did the crime, therefore that means that I need to be a big boy, big girl, and, and just uh, and, and man up or, or woman up and do the, do the time, right? That's what it means. Maybe if I suffer enough. Maybe if I have enough people pray for me. Maybe maybe if I suffer enough. Maybe if I do three Hail Marys and give up watching my favorite TV show for a week. Do we think that way? Yes! Such thinking isn't only unscriptural. It causes us to lie to ourselves, God, and everyone else. It leads to self-loathing and eventually God hating. How many knows what we're talking about? Ask a child. Ask a child who broke something. Who broke that? Charlie, who broke that? Katie Bell, who broke that? Grayson, who broke that? Paisley, who broke that? Cramps, who punched you in the eye? Ask a child who's to blame, and they'll blame anyone other than themselves. Are we so much different? Why do they do that? Because they want to avoid the punishment. They want to avoid the punishment. But even worse than that, they want to avoid the disapproval, the separation being marked by the very people whose approval they seek the most. Boy, that rings some bells. Ding, ding, ding. Yeah. If a child gets punished severely enough, frequently enough, that child will grow up to be a compulsive liar. They will lie when no lie is received. 
having those old knock on them. Genuine repentance has nothing to do with that whatsoever. Repent simply means this. Change your mind. Change your mind. Change your mind. Oh, I was blind, now I see. Now I see the error of my ways. The light of the Holy Spirit illuminates something that is causing us to miss God's best for our lives. We come into agreement with God's perspective and we're changing our actions accordingly. We are repenting. For it is God, it says in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Real repentance isn't a feeling. It's not a feeling. In fact, it has not much of anything to do with feelings. Feelings get us in trouble. I mean, knows what we're talking about. Feelings get us in trouble more times than not. Real repentance has very little to do with feelings. Well, I feel sorry, preacher. You should. I feel sorry I did it. You should. I should. We should feel sorry. But here's my point, and listen carefully. Judas felt sorry. Hello? Judas felt sorry for betraying Jesus. And he went and hung himself. Instead of changing his mind and confessing before God the Father what he had done, and come in an agreement with what God had to say about his actions and getting forgiveness and restoration and then changing his ways from that point forward. Instead of doing that, he felt sorry. And because he felt sorry and didn't get right with God, he went and hung himself. Wrong response. Suicide is always about the person who took their own life. And we might be, and I think that we would be right to be and have compassion towards Judas. But don't follow in his footsteps. Certainly don't follow his example. Because his example is the complete wrong example. Because suicide isn't about what he did to Jesus. It's about how he felt about himself because of what he had done to Jesus. And we fall into the same trap. Suicide is about the person who took their own life, although often they will blame someone else. Repentance is about getting it right with someone else, regardless of what it cost us. Do you see the difference? Do you understand that? We're talking about two completely different things. We should feel sorry when we don't do right. But then we must take great measures to make sure that we don't repeat the behavior that brought about the offense in the first place. Genuine repentance will prevent us from becoming discarded silver. Well, preacher, why is this all so important this morning? Here's why it's so important. God once upon a time labeled his chosen people rejected silver. And he says in the NLT version that he had discarded them. Something which had once held great value had become worthless. I believe we, the church in America and Christianity in general, are at a similar point in our history. And I believe that we are at great risk once again of being labeled rejected silver. The failures of Israel, what's that have to do with me, preacher? It has everything to do with you, as I said in my opening remarks this morning. The failures of Israel were not the failures of their children. We got this thing in our mind that when we reach a certain age, that we don't, our, our, our faith is just something that we carry with us as a security blanket. It is a Passed to an eternal destiny and little, little more. 
we reach a certain point, it's like, well, I did my time. I went to church regularly during this period of my life, and I don't need to go anymore, and I've got all I need to get, and I don't need to listen to the preaching or do my devotions or read my Bible or even necessarily witness to the lost, or I don't need to support the church financially. I don't... Do we not? What does this have to do with us? Only everything. Israel's failures were not the failure of the children. Rather, the failure of the folks more our own age, much closer to our age. They failed to live their faith in a way that was real in the eyes of their children. Boom. There it is. What do you think has happened in America? Why do you think that our churches are closing by the thousands every year? Can I tell you why? Because the mature adults did not live their faith in a way that appeared real in the eyes of their children. Folks in Harmony, can I say to us this morning that if our children failed, it's because we failed first. We okay with that? And I'm not talking about whether the preacher keeps his act straight or not. I'm talking about every single one of us. Did you hear what I said? I'm talking about every single one of us. I'm not talking about the preacher. I'm not talking about the preacher's wife. I'm not talking about the leadership team, Kalika and Ben, Ron, and these others. I'm talking about everybody here. I'm talking about everybody that's associated with Harmony. I'm talking about the people that aren't here this morning. I'm talking about all of us. If our children fail, it's because we fail first. Our children are watching our examples. All of our examples. In fact, each of you have a greater amount of influence on my son and my daughter-in-law and my grandchildren, Grayson and Paisley, than either Treva or myself. Did you hear what I said? You all have greater influence on my family than I do. Can I mess them up? Oh, yeah. But can I tell you who they're really watching for their cues? Clues. Okay. Not this guy. But you are. But you are. A kid can spot a kid can spot a discrepancy a mile away. They don't even know what they're looking at. They wouldn't even know what to call it when they saw it, but they know what it is. They know whether your faith is real to you or not. They know whether you're living in a manner that says, oh, there must be something to their faith or not. Even if they don't know that what they're why they are a child of the king. I believe God gives children discretion that, that, that is none of us, to be honest with you. They're watching to see what our examples are. Well, it just wasn't important enough to go anymore. It was cold that morning. You know, well, I used to support the church, but, you know, I just, I quit. They don't need it, really. They don't need my money. You know, I just, I just decided I needed to change. See, this is what happened in Israel. That's why they became rejected silver. One because of what the kids did, it's because of what the people who should have been setting these out were doing. Do we understand that? 
That's what's happening in America today. We can talk about how important our faith is till we're blue in the face. But until we live it by example, without words that can be interpreted that it is important, then it makes no difference. Our kids aren't going to do right. They're not going to grow up God fearing. They're not going to do any of that until they see us do it first. And that means it's going to cost us something. It means you're going to get up and go to church when you don't want to go to church. Right. It means you're going to support the church when you're trying to figure out whether you can find another nickel to rub to the one that you just found. It means that you're going to do right even when you want to do wrong. It means that you're going to charge the right price for your services even when you know the person could pay a lot more and you can kind of fudge the wording a little bit and be to see us living our faith in a way that says God would never have called them this far to silver. God would never reject them because very clearly they believe what they say they believe. They watch you guys. And this is not the little ones. The teens watch you guys. You get called and comes up here and plays the piano. And I said these words, if that's how they can act and say what they say about it, there's nothing to it. And for 14 years, I was convinced that there was one truth in the world that was true. That was truth. Now I've got to assume responsibility for misplaced faith. Did you hear me? But nonetheless, if a nation or a people come to the point where God says, I'm, I'm rejecting you, you are discarded silver, it will be because the people our age fail to leave their faith in a way that was believable in the eyes of the younger generation. What messages are we sending? How will we be remembered? Here's how I don't want to be remembered. Because it matters. May God never have to use the words discarded silver as it relates to his people everywhere. Not just here. Everywhere. May he never have to use those words again. I pray for a revival among the children of God and the body of Christ. And I believe it's on its way. Why do you say that? What are you looking at? Because the separating process that the Bible talks about is so there. And you see people just walking away, rejecting their faith, making their decisions. And when you see that happening, you're going to begin to see revival in the lives of people who are saying, I too am making a decision. 
I'm going to go all the way with the Lord. You're going to see the church once again become, I believe, what God has always wanted for it to be and what scriptures say that it will be when Jesus returns. I don't want to miss that. I don't want to miss that. I don't want to be over in the pile of that which got rejected and this got to go. Or this got lifted up and shared in the glory of Christ. Okay, you just got in. I don't want to just get in. I don't want, I don't want, to, just, I don't want to just run the race. I don't want to be an also ran. Do you? No. You know, James and John had some lofty aspirations, didn't they? They put their put their mama up to going and asking Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> oh, hey, mom. <laughs> you know, here's what we want. Go, go see what he says to you. And we laugh about that. But yeah, I want to sit on his right hand or his left hand. I'll take whatever he'll give me. And it'll be great. But yeah, I want, that's, that's, Yes. I don't want to be somebody that stumbles through life and fumbles through life and has a casual testimony, taints everything that I touch. I don't want to be that. Why? Because he is, he is, he is everything. And I want everybody that I can possibly, hey, let's go. Come with me. Go with me. See him. Be with him. Live for him. Live with him. Are you with me? Not rejected silver. Not something discarded. It looked like silver. Thought it was silver. It was partly silver, but in the end, fan as we might, just couldn't get the impurities out of it. You know, he was just had to throw it away. 